Hi everyone, happy Friday. Welcome to the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation's Ask the Expert series. Today we are focused on speech, language, and swallowing with DM. It is June 18th and we are excited that you have joined us today. The MDF mission, Care and Cure, is to enhance the quality of life of people living with myotonic dystrophy and accelerate research focused on finding treatments and a cure. Our work focuses on support and education, research, and advocacy. Please visit our website for many resources and different support opportunities that are posted. We have toolkits and publications, including clinical care guidelines and recommendations. Support group opportunities, including Facebook chats, are on our website. Our entire calendar of events for the year, which includes our activities and our digital academy and this will include today's presentation once that gets posted as well as presentations and videos from past events so visit the digital academy for today's presentation in a few days and any of our past presentations we are very excited to announce the international myotonic dystrophy awareness day on september 15th if you haven't already learn a little bit more about the global alliance and how you can get involved to raise awareness for myotonic dystrophy at myotonic.org slash international dash DM dash day. Okay, today is the third Friday of the month, 12 o'clock Pacific, and we are talking about speech language and swallowing. But next month on the third Friday at 12 o'clock Pacific, we'll be talking about the brain and myotonic dystrophy and the following month, is anxiety and myotonic dystrophy. So don't forget to register for those new sessions which have just, which have just recently been added, myotonic.org slash ask dash expert dash series. Similarly, on the first Friday of the month at 12 o'clock Pacific, we are meeting DM drug developers. So we have coming up on July 2nd, Harmony Biosciences, and on August 6th, Avidity Biosciences. You can register and submit your questions for these drug companies at myotonic.org slash meet dash DM dash drug dash developers. Today's session will be recorded and posted to the Digital Academy. You also as a participant today will receive a direct email with the recording. If you have questions about today's presentation, you can contact MDF at the phone number here or via email at info at myotonic.org. Today, you are here to hear from Ms. Kira Berggren. She is a research speech language pathologist in the Department of Neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University. Prior to working as an SLP, she had trained as a chemist and worked as a research technician in several different labs. She started her second career as a speech language pathologist in rehabilitation following acquired neurological injuries such as stroke and traumatic brain injury. She quickly discovered a passion for working with individuals with neurodegenerative diseases and currently provides swallowing, communication, and cognitive support to patients and families in multidisciplinary clinics. Marrying her current career and her research background has allowed her to also be active in research in several neuromuscular diseases, including myotonic dystrophy, FSHD, ALS, and others where she focuses on oral facial strength, swallow function, and changes in speech. Kira is one of the very few SLPs in the world focused on myotonic dystrophy, so we are very fortunate to have her with us today. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use your chat box, func chat box function in Myotonic Dystrophy. Use the drop down menu to select send question for staff. So you have to select quen send question for staff, otherwise she's not going to get the question. So if you do have a question, we'd love for you to submit it at any point during the presentation. She will answer the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but make sure you send question for staff in the chat drop down menu so she gets those. All right. Thank you all so much for joining and welcome Kira.
Hi there. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tanya. Hopefully I've got everything set up and looking good on my end. Um, so uh, as Tanya mentioned, I'm a speech language pathologist and I'll talk with you today a little bit about myotonic dystrophy and speech therapy and sort of how those two interact. Um, uh, and at the end, certainly happy to answer questions and I'll also provide my email if people would like to contact me as well. Um, I have served as a consultant uh, to the Critical Path Institute and, um, and I have no other relevant financial disclosures. So the question I get all the time um, is, what does a speech language pathologist do? So I thought I would throw that in here as one of our learning objectives. Um, so what does a speech language pathologist do? What areas are affected in myotonic dystrophy and congenital myotonic dystrophy that might benefit from speech therapy? And kind of what to expect as well if you choose to participate in speech therapy. So a speech language pathologist, we're also known as a speech therapist, but we really are not just about speaking. Um, we are responsible for and get training in as part of our, our graduate work in voice, the sound that our body makes as we're communicating, as we're singing, as we're humming, all of those things. Um, speech, of course, it's in the name. Um, and so to us, that means how we kind of shape those sounds that we use when we're communicating with other individuals. And there's a whole bunch of systems that kind of underlie all of this, but the main ones that we think about are articulation and fluency or stuttering, as it were. Um, and then there's language itself, the symbols that we use and the pragmatic behaviors that we use so when we're communicating with people. And I like to always remind people that language and communication really is a bunch of different modalities. It's reading, it's talking, it's listening as you guys are doing now and, and, and certainly writing as well. Um, and we do this all the time, whether it's a text to somebody or, um, uh, you know, a Facebook post or something like that. So we, we all use language in a lot of different ways. Um, hearing is also a, a very small part of our domain as well. We're not audiologists by any stretch. It is our sister profession, I like to say, um, but it's very integral to communication. If hearing is, uh, um, if there's an issue with hearing, then that really makes listening during a conversation challenging. Uh, and so hearing is definitely a part of um, what we do. Cognition, those thinking skills, um, and there's a whole bunch of them. I like to call out some in particular attention, memory, um, problem solving. Executive function is kind of the behavior regulation uh, thing. So initiating, planning, um, maybe inhibiting behaviors, as well. So things like we know, the example I like to use is um, if you are at the library, you're not screaming and yelling or having a dance party or something like that because you're inhibiting those behaviors. Um, and then swallow. Um, so most people in my profession would say we're really responsible for everything from kind of the neck up and swallow is definitely part of that as well too. And I think of swallow as from when you put food in the mouth to getting all the way down into your stomach. Um, there's really been a push, and I wanted to, to kind of call this out um, as well, specifically in the healthcare field, to, to moving towards more person-centered care. So as speech-language pathologists, we're really trained to um, be thinking about um, engaging our patients and their families to have personalized care, individualized care. Um, and I love this quote from Ballant from back in 1969. So this is not a... a new concept by any stretch, but we're really um, moving into it with the in the medical community much more. But it's understanding the patient as a really unique human being. Um, and so we want our individuals to be um, that we're working with to be engaged in the work, um, identify goals with us. It's not for us to dictate those goals um, and really taking into account the beliefs, the preferences, what the family is interested in as well to identify a really comprehensive care plan that's customized for an individual person, whether it is in the schools, whether it's in the medical setting where I work, um, or uh, anywhere in between. So it's very much a collaborative effort focused on the patient and the person. So myotonic dystrophy and speech therapy. Um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll kind of go through the different sort of um, areas of speech language pathology and how they relate to myotonic dystrophy. So uh, in 
the speech side of things, we might hear the term dysarthria, and that is abnormal speech, although I dislike the term abnormal, but maybe altered speech is a better way of thinking about it. And so, again, speech are those sounds that you're hearing me make right now as I'm talking with you. Um, and there's a, a, several different types of dysarthria out there, um, but the ones that I see the most common in the neuromuscular diseases that I work with um, uh, and specifically in myotonic dystrophy is flaccid dysarthria, also spastic dysarthria um, in, in some other diseases that I see. Um, and that just really means low tone. So those muscles just don't have as much kind of oomph to them. They're not maybe as strong. They maybe don't move as far as they, they might in an average person. Um, so and we'll kind of go over this a little bit more here. Um, so some symptoms, kind of classic symptoms of flaccid dysarthria are maybe articulation or the precision of our speech is not as um, precise as we would like it to be. People may have some reduced volume or their rate of speech may be a little bit slower. Um, the use of prosody and stress may be altered. So you can hear sort of the melody of my speech as I'm talking with you today. Um, that's our prosody. And part of that is the stress that I'm putting on, on the syllables and the words that I'm using. So there's also can be as a part of sort of the definition of flaccid dysarthria, hypernasality. So more air is going into the nasal cavity as we're talking than might with the average person. And if there's a lot of air, it may come out as kind of nasal emissions, little short bursts of air that come out through the nose. Um, and persons with flaccid dysarthria may also have very reduced breath support as well if that diaphragm or the muscles of the rib cage are involved. Um, so I, I underlined a few things on this slide, and those are features that I see most commonly in CDM as well. So persons with myotonic dystrophy, whether it's DM1, DM2, CDM, may have any or all of these features, but the underlined ones are ones that I see very commonly in um, children with the congenital form that I see. So if somebody were going to engage in speech therapy uh, to address dysarthria, in general, you know, we really want to address the specific area of concern. So if the person has difficulty with how they sound or there's certain communication or excuse me, settings where they have difficulty communicating, then we kind of want to take that into account. Um, you know, if somebody has trouble speaking with the bus driver um, because of all the extra noise there, we work on maybe getting a little bit louder uh, or working with a partner who's um, working with a patient whose partner maybe has some hearing loss or a child whose parents have some hearing loss will really kind of address uh, you know that situational piece um, and in myotonic dystrophy in particular with the adult forms we want to make sure um, if there's myotonia present that may be impacting this um, as I mentioned with the person-centered care model, thinking about what are the person's goals for therapy and really developing unique strategies. Um, so for many people with flaccid dysarthria, I might say, you know, let's practice over articulating or getting louder or maybe slowing down just ever so slightly or really more kind of putting a little gap in between words so that the listener can kind of mark where those different words begin and end. Um, that can be a lot easier for the listener. Um, and for some individuals, especially um, our children with myotonic dystrophy, the congenital form, using what we call augmentative or alternative communication or AAC may be um, a target in speech therapy. So if, um, We'll switch now to talking a little bit about language as well. Uh, and so with myotonic dystrophy in particular, there may be difficulty seen in expressive language, receptive language, bo um, really both sides of the language um, area. In adults, it's not generally as much of a lar uh, an area of concern. It's even less so in DM2 than it is in DM1, um, but certainly things like pragmatics and overall thinking abilities can impact that communication side. Language is a cognitive skill, and if cognition in general is a little bit reduced, then that can impact language. Um, and a specific call out to, in myotonic dystrophy, in the adult form for sure, um, the, the presence of cataracts may affect that ability to use language. If we think about that ability to um, read the written word, um, 
that can be uh, problematic in DM. In CDM, uh, language skills are often reduced and some children may be completely nonverbal. Uh, changes in hearing or vision can also be affected and can really impact that communication piece in CDM. Um, we did have some early questions that came in um, prior to this talk going live. And one question we had was, um, what's the difference between dysphagia? You'll hear me talk about that in a few minutes, and it's the, the word at the bottom here, but spelled with a G instead of an, an S in the near the end of the word. Um, dysphagia with an S, with two S's, let's call it that, is um, another term that's sometimes used in the field uh, to discuss difficulties with language, but it's not very commonly used. And unfortunately, both words are pronounced the same, so it makes it a little challenging to differentiate, but you'll see when I get to the dysphagia slides, the swallowing slides in a few moments, what I mean. Um, so if somebody's coming in for uh, speech therapy to address concerns around language, we really want to sit down and do a comprehensive assessment and look at you know, what areas of language are affected, how does that uh, interact or interplay with the communication and the communication needs of that particular individual and family dynamic? Um, and what are some functional goals that might be targeted? So in myotonic dystrophy, the adult form, I often hear that facial expressions are decreased. I see that oral facial weakness is very common um, and that can impact communication. You know, we, you can see if somebody's smiling, you can kind of hear it in their voice, but it also helps add to that communicative intent um, that they're maybe making a joke or enjoying having a conversation. And without those facial expressions, it may appear that somebody's grumpier or unhappy or something like that. So um, in uh, the pragmatics piece, that involves kind of taking turns in conversation. Uh, so that may be a target in DM. Um, and again, uh, as in the speech side of things and uh, the DM2, I don't tend to see these as often as affected. Um, it tends to be kind of a milder area of concern um, but uh, than it is with the adult onset form of DM1. In CDM, these little ones um, have an extra additional sort of hurdle in that they're really developing language. They're young people, just like all of us have been. Um, and so they're trying to develop those language skills at the same time where they may actually be impacted because of the CDM itself. So it's kind of a special um, area of therapy. And for individuals, especially that are nonverbal, maybe using, again, that augmentative uh, or alternative communication. And there's like a whole area involved in evaluating the appropriateness, having training, customizing this, and altering it along the way as the child's language skills develop. Um, so it's a very specialized kind of niche in my field. Some examples of AAC um, or alternative techniques out there. Um, you can see going left to right um, on the far left, uh, hopefully it shows up on your screen clear enough. This is actually a screenshot of an app I have on my phone that I use to demonstrate in clinic. Um, and I've modified this app so that I have a button on there that says I would like some chocolate stat. This is something that was is really important, important to me. Um, but in general, this app has buttons on there for categories and then buttons on there for um, specific items within a category and you can customize it. Um, if you want to type something more novel, you can pull up a keyboard on there and ask, you know, who's going to win the hockey game tonight or, or something like that. Um, so it's a nice one, but it's maybe a little bit more appropriate for an adult with um, intact language skills, but maybe with verbal communication changes that make them maybe not as clear. Um, the black item, kind of the second item from the left is what's called a boogie board. It's basically kind of like a whiteboard. It's an electronic whiteboard and you can write right on it with a little stylus or the end of a pen or your fingernail and then just hit a button and it erases the screen for you. It's kind of like a, a glorified Etch-a-Sketch if, if people remember those devices from back in the day. Um, but that can be handy if it's just a single word that somebody has difficulty hearing. You can write it down real quick and show somebody. Um, the third item is another example of a, a 
text-to-speech app where you can type things in, use the word prediction features. Many of these are available on both tablets and phones. Um, and then the item on the far right is a device from a manufacturer that is specifically designed to be a speech generating device uh, and it has a program on there that you can customize a little bit as well too uh, for communicating unique needs and all of that. If somebody needs one of these devices or tools, um, you know, certainly meet with a speech language pathologist and talk with them about it. There's no, there's never a one size fits all. And I would never say either that there's one item that's gonna meet all communication needs for an individual person. So it's often sort of sitting down and figuring out what your communication toolbox might look like for somebody who um, is having difficulty with verbal communication. So if we shift gears now and talk a little bit about cognition in myotonic dystrophy, uh, areas that I see um, that I lump under cognition, attention, memory, problem solving, that, that reasoning, thinking skills, the executive function skills that I mentioned earlier as well. Um, in the adult form, uh, overall intelligence is often normal, especially with myotonic dystrophy type 2. Um, at symptom, symptom onset, it can decline over time, uh, more so uh, with more severity in DM1. Uh, in DM1 in particular, we also see a little bit more what appears to be apathy um, and some of those executive function pieces, that self-regulation. Um, people may be a little bit more impulsive, jump in in conversations, things like that. Um, in CDM, overall intelligence is, is usually impaired. Not always. We do have some uh, children that, that I've seen both as part of studies and clinically where intelligence is, is in the normal range, in the average range. Um, but overlaying this can also, in the children, can be features of autism, um, and that can sort of impact communication and some of the cognitive features for all of us. Uh, so if somebody were going to be engaging in speech therapy to address some of these concerns, uh, it might be beneficial to participate in a neuropsychological assessment. Um, this is an area where neuropsychologists can do this. Some neuropsych testing can be done by speech language pathologists as well. Again, we kind of the neck up, so we do the brain as well. Um, and once we have done that testing, whether formally through a neuropsychologist or through a speech language pathologist, we really, um, pop, what pops up in that testing is kind of what areas of concern there might be. And then usually I would engage the patient and the family um, in a conversation of these are areas that we see might be um, things we want to address, but what, what works for you? What are some things that from a functional standpoint that we can, we can work on? Uh, and so for DM, the adult form, um, maybe providing additional strategies so that person can continue to live independently uh, if there's, uh, you know, it, whether it's in their own apartment or with family or however that looks. Uh, and again, DM1 is a little bit more effective than, than DM2 in this area. Um, with CDM, uh, really this is testing that goes on in the school system and there will be an individualized support plan that can be developed with the speech language pathologist, the teacher, the family for sure has involvement with this. The child is, is more than welcome to participate as they are able to and really develop by developing either an IEP, individualized education plan for school age children or a 504 plan or for younger children an individualized family service plan. Uh, and especially if you're also engaging in outpatient therapy, strategies that can be useful to have the child be productive at home as well and, and engage in self-care and you know, helping out around the house and things like that. So, so we'll turn now to swallow. Um, and here's where that, that term dysphagia comes in again with the alternate spelling. So um, dysphagia really just means abnormal swallowing. And when I think of this, it, it, I really, as I mentioned earlier, I think of it from, you know, once the food gets in the mouth, does it stay in the mouth? Does it come out? Um, does it go down? Does it go down all in one piece? Um, what does it look like in the throat? What does it look like in the esophagus? Um, and dysphagia, if things, if, 
if swallow is disordered and we're repeatedly getting things into the lungs or down the wrong tube, as many of us say, um, this can result in an aspiration pneumonia. And um, it is the leading cause of death in adult onset DM. And so the asterisk there is that um, the paper I was looking at about this didn't really differentiate between myotonic dystrophy type 1 and type 2 in the adult form, so they kind of lumped them all together. Um, again, DM2 tends to be less severe, but I do see patients in our adult um, MDA clinic with swallowing difficulties that also have DM2. So in DM in particular, in the adult form, um, what I see a lot of times is that lips may be not quite as strong, so there's difficulty keeping food or liquid in the mouth. There's often a, kind of an open mouth posture that um, and there ends up be, maybe being crumbs on the, the lips, the chin, um, maybe dropping into the lap. Um, I have quite a few patients that tell me that they feel like food gets stuck, whether that's in the mouth, the throat, um, kind of, sort of at the upper part of the chest. Individuals commonly will say that there's coughing or choking when they're eating or drinking. Um, and um, related a little bit to those, that cognitive functioning piece, that impulsivity, I put in here rate of ingestion. I, I hear commonly, and it's well documented in the literature, all of these features, that people may be more rapid when they're eating. Uh, so that can be an area that we may want to target in therapy. And then specifically in the adult form, um, the myotonia itself may impact. I have many patients that comment on myotonia in the jaw, the tongue, even the muscles of the throat. I have um, quite a few people that will talk about esophageal sensations as well. Uh, so, it, and we know that the um, DM can affect the muscles of the esophagus. So. With the CDM version, um, every, all the features that I listed above in the adult for, version, except for the myotonia, especially in our younger children, um, can occur. And I also see quite frequently children that avoid specific textures. So as part of a natural history study that I've been involved with for the last seven years, um, I historically, I mean, I would say the vast majority of my individuals, my young children in that study, tend to avoid puree items or maybe have more difficulty with some, some harder to eat items. Um, and in, at birth, especially if a child is maybe more severely affected, feeding difficulties are kind of a cardinal sign in CDM. And so there may be uh, uh, feeding tube may be necessary uh, at birth and in the, the neonatal period in CDM. So a quick shout out to sort of the anatomy and physiology, um, just to give you a little bit of information on this. So there's, as you can see on this, there's a lot of muscles that are involved in the swallowing. Um, so to kind of get you oriented, this is kind of a side view of somebody. Um, and you can see up uh, near the top is kind of the nasal cavity to the left of the nose. Um, the hard palate directly below that and then directly below that is the oral cavity where the tongue is there and takes up the bulk of the space actually in the oral cavity. Um, directly behind the nasal cavity, the hard palate, the tongue is kind of the back of the throat area or what we call the pharynx. Um, and then sort of below that you can see there's a little um, pointer to a little tiny white or sort of white shelf looking thing called the epiglottis. Um, that's actually a nice cap for our airway. So when we go to swallow, in my perfect world, somebody puts food in their mouth, they chew it up, their tongue moves it around, and then they get ready to swallow it. Their tongue really fills that entire oral cavity and pushes the food back um, into the back of the throat. And as that happens, the epiglottis flips, flips over, a few more things happen. Our esophagus then opens, it's closed to the vast majority of the time while we're sitting breathing. Um, and as all that happens, the food um, passes through our throat and into our esophagus and then down into our stomach. Um, so it's, it's very complex, it's very finely timed and tuned. Um, we definitely don't want food to get back into our throat before our airway is closed up. Um, that's where we get aspiration or food into our airway. Uh, and this all happens pretty quickly. Usually it gets to the tummy once we start to swallow um, in about two seconds. So it's pretty fast. Um, I like to throw up here as well the idea that kind of total meal, meal time is usually 
20 minutes is about average in our country. Um, 10 to 30 minutes is not uncommon. Um, I hear quite frequently in myotonic dystrophy that that mealtime may only be like five or 10 minutes as people are eating very rapidly. But you can see with all of this really fine coordination that needs to go on with swallowing that that can lead to some impairments. Um, if we get too much food in the mouth, some might sneak into the airway. Um, or not, not all of it gets cleared out of the mouth and the throat um, so that we can breathe safely without breathing in particles of food or liquid. So um, some kind of general signs of dysphagia. One of the things that I like to really talk with folks about is the idea of that avoiding specific foods. So I mentioned that a moment ago when we think about um, the congenital form of myotonic dystrophy. But this is a question I ask all of my patients that I see. Um, is the one of the first questions I ask is, are you eating everything you've historically eaten or are you avoiding specific foods? Uh, so I think of food kind of on this continuum of complexity from the left-hand side where we have solid um, items there, um, bread, popcorn, um, salad, raw carrots, other raw veggies, whole meat, so steak, chicken, pork, that kind of stuff. Um, through the puree items in the middle. These are the very homogeneous things that don't have a lot of other textures to them. They're kind of one texture. So applesauce, yogurt, pudding, et cetera. This is the region that um, I see my children this with CDM maybe having a little bit more difficulty with and avoid. And then the other end, the right end of my spectrum are those liquids. So water, apple juice, coffee, wine, things like that. I always like to put in here ice cream because we, when that melts in our mouth, it actually just becomes milk or cream and then is really much more of a liquid and can be more challenging to, to manipulate uh, safely. So if you look at this spectrum, you can think going left to right, somebody might have to swallow more strongly for items on the left hand side than they would on the far right hand side, right? We put more kind of oomph into our swallow if we have, you know, a bite of steak that we're trying to get down versus. A, a sip of water. Uh, so if I'm hearing that people are avoiding foods, I immediately am thinking in my head kind of where that falls and in the complexity arena and if people are having difficulty, um, you know, where does that end up? So if somebody is having difficulty swallowing, there's um, under kind of the assessment thing for myotonic dystrophy, we may uh, engage in a swallow evaluation. There's several different kinds. There's a clinical swallow evaluation, and this is one that's really just done either in the school classroom or in the speech therapist room in school or it, in the hospital setting. It may be also called a bedside swallow evaluation, and it's really our chance to look at how are all the nerves working and try some different foods and liquids from kind of across that continuum to see are there any symptoms that we're seeing um, and I always like to encourage people to consider as well fatigue over the course of a meal so you know the first bite may look very different than the last bite and especially in myotonic dystrophy uh, we know that there is this warm-up phenomenon where individuals may be um, first thing in the morning, have more difficulty with breakfast, have more difficulty with dinner, but during the middle of the day, those muscles are kind of warmed up and going, um, and people may have less difficulty then. Um, so I like to make sure my swallow studies maybe go over a little bit of time so that we can see, are there any difficulties later in a meal versus the first part of the meal? Um, there are also instrumental evaluations, so a FEES, the fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, where they, um, and then an ear, nose, and throat physician may, or a speech language pathologist may put a camera up your nose, down your throat. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds, I promise, where they can really then watch what's happening in the throat real time and as somebody is eating and see where does the food go and how do things look. Um, another version of an instrumental evaluation is a modified barium swallow study. It goes by many different names as well too. And that's really uh, a chance to go to our fluoro fluoroscopy suite and do a video, an x-ray video from the side um, and from the front of where food goes when we swallow as well too, or when we're chewing. And those are really useful for us to be able to identify what the concern is, um, you know, and see what, maybe what strategies might work. I always like to tell people that 
any swallow assessment, the goal of the swallow test is not to pass fail. It's really to figure out, you know, what are what is somebody doing well? Where where is an area that maybe we need to bump things up a little bit? And how can we kind of develop a care plan around that? Do we use therapeutic exercises um, in the rehabilitation side of things, therapeutic exercises are very commonly used. There's unfortunately not a lot of research just yet in myotonic dystrophy about use of therapeutic exercises. Um, so maybe we identify some strategies that might be useful to um, keep somebody a little bit safer when they're eating or drinking. Um, and if I'm a speech therapist working with somebody with DM or anybody really, I really like to have a conversation around what oral hygiene looks like as well too. Um, not a dentist, I tell my patients, but the American Dental Association does recommend that we brush our teeth twice a day, make sure we floss um, between teeth or use a water pick or something like that. Limit those sugary snacks. That's tough for, for all of us, I think. Um, and then certainly visit a dentist a couple times a year. The idea behind discussing this around uh, when I'm seeing somebody for swallowing concerns is if things go down the wrong tube or when they go down the wrong tube, because it happens to all of us, we really want to make sure that that mouth is fairly clean, if not really clean, to make sure there's not a lot of bacteria that's also going down the wrong tube, as, as it were. Um, so I really try and encourage that good oral hygiene. Um, for individuals at home, um, so more of the adult patients that I see, some tips that I might uh, give, pass along to people, or making sure people are upright. Um, so they're kind of sitting at 90 degrees instead of tilted back. Um, really supporting that trunk if we need to. Um, it's not as common a concern in myotonic dystrophy, although I do have some patients that maybe a little bit less trunk support. Uh, so we want to make sure we're in a good chair. Um, encouraging people to take smaller bites and sips, we're all safer that way. There is some initial evidence in DM in particular that uh, there may be some sensory component to this where smaller bites aren't sort of triggering our minds to say, oh, I need to swallow. Uh, so sometimes I feel like individuals may be taking larger bites just so that it sort of encourages them to, to take that next bit and swallow it down. Single bites and sips, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes people are impulsive and kind of overfill their mouth. Uh, so want to make sure that we're doing just single sips, bites, alternating bites with sips if we feel like food is stuck anywhere. Um, a straw may be useful for individuals if we're seeing a lot of coughing or choking with um, liquids uh, and that can help kind of keep our chin parallel to the floor and kind of give us an optimal um, positioning to help with swallowing. Um, for myotonic dystrophy in particular, limiting distractions during the meal, uh, so not having the TV on, not playing on your phone while you're uh, eating a meal, not really having a very animated conversation. This is a challenging one as we're all social creatures, um, but you know the goal is really to kind of limit talking with food in your mouth, like mom said, um, what, don't talk with food in your mouth. Um, for individuals that they're maybe having difficulty on that left end of my food continuum uh, with drier foods, moistening foods, maybe taking medications in a bite of puree if they if somebody can tolerate puree items, um, or if you're a partner sitting with somebody while they're eating or a child while they're eating and you can see food in the mouth still, really encouraging them to take a second swallow or a third swallow before they take another bite, um, just to decrease how much residue is there and the potential for food going down the wrong tube. I might tell individuals to, in a, as a way to kind of limit fatigue during meals, having smaller, more frequent meals or having more difficult items, you know, in my, my attack dystrophy, maybe earlier in the day or the middle of the day when we have a little bit more energy. Um, softer foods can be easier, certainly, um, you know, using a crock pot or an instant pot or having casseroles. And really the ultimate goal of this is to manage the situation so that the person is person that um, is having difficulty with swallow is as safe as they can possibly be. Um, 
So shifting gears a little bit now, kind of how to find a speech language pathologist. I would say starting off, um, this was actually a question that came through before this talk. So I would certainly ask your neurologist for a recommendation or your primary care physician. Certainly you can contact the MDF um, and see if they have maybe somebody local in, their, in your area that is on their radar. Um, I'm certainly happy to answer questions along those lines as well too. And I often will work with SLPs in other areas um, to, to help kind of brainstorm tips and tricks. And I would encourage you to really um, kind of own this experience and say, you know, and ask the person, especially if, um, you know, it's somebody that you're unfamiliar with, do you have experience working with persons with DM? Um, and do you work with your families, uh, your children, your adults to create goals that are that are their goals, that are really person-centered goals. And um, are you willing to learn more about DM? Uh, it's, as all of this community knows, it's a rare disease. And so we don't, uh, many practitioners don't know as much about myotonic dystrophy. And so, you know, coming armed with some education for them, uh, if they're open to learning about it is great. And really wanna stress that, you know, is the personality gonna be a good fit? And again, you know, are they gonna have that person-centered care? So a couple more slides here and kind of wrapping up. Um, there was a guide, care guideline that uh, several of us speech language pathologists got together and worked with the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation to generate that is available on the website in their toolkits and publications area. Um, this is kind of what it looks like on the cover. Uh, and then some additional more general resources that maybe aren't speech language pathology specific. Um, uh, Huge shout out to the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. Um, they've done a really nice job with this. I've had quite a few patients that really like this first item on this list, the how does it affect your body? That It's got this picture of the body and different areas of the body highlighted and you can hover over those and learn a little bit more. And so encouraging, um, you know, care providers to look at this, family members to look at this, um, speech language pathologists that you're working with um, to look at that. And then a shout out uh, to reiterate Tanya's shout out for the toolkits and publications piece. There are clinical care recommendations for DM2, DM1 in the adult form, CDM, and these are again, more global recommendations. And I, I really wanted to put a nod out there too, to the one that is for, individuals that maybe have children that are going to school with DM um, and understanding the whole process. It's complicated and nobody um, is expecting families to be an expert in this. And so having this guide is a really nice tool to have. So um, there were a few more questions that kind of popped up beforehand uh, that I couldn't quite work in the way uh, the talk was going. So I wanted to put them out here. So I had somebody ask early on, can swallowing imp issues impact the lungs? I hope um, I've sort of shown that yes, uh, if there are swallowing issues, um, it means that there is food going down the wrong tube potentially that can go in the lungs that can lead to those aspiration pneumonias as I mentioned. Um, yeah, everybody on the planet has aspirated, I guarantee it. Um, but if it's something that's happening all the time with all different food consistencies, that's a different sort of beast. Um, and I wouldn't say it necessarily, dysphagia necessarily makes COVID-19 worse, but we know COVID-19 definitely impacts those lungs. Um, I think we've all heard that um, for the last 15, 16 months now, a year and a half almost. Um, and so if our lungs are already impacted, maybe breathing is impacted, that can actually have the reverse effect. It can actually affect swallowing because swallowing, we do um, have to hold our breath when we swallow. And so if we're already having breathing issues because of COVID or any other respiratory issue, uh, that can, can kind of challenge swallowing being a safe um, activity. So it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, somebody also asked about how do you talk about speech therapy with kids? I, I tend to default to, you know, obviously make it age appropriate. Um, 
many kids are, you know, we don't, none of us want to feel special and get pulled out, but really encouraging them and, and highlight the positive pieces of this. And, you know, oh, look, I can understand you. You're doing so well. Oh, you're eating these foods that maybe you hadn't eaten before and, and really focus on those pieces. Um, and certainly talk with the speech language pathologist that you're working with in the schools and, and get tips and tricks from them. Um, how common is dysphagia in DM as well as uh, sort of other neurological disorders? In the neuromuscular world, many of them have dysphagia, but certainly not all of them. DM tends to be one of the ones that I see dysphagia much more frequently than I do in many others. Uh, so some of the literature is saying anywhere from 25 to 80 percent of individuals with myotonic dystrophy can have dysphagia. Um, and I would certainly say anecdotally from what I see in clinic, um, I would absolutely agree with those numbers. Um, some other neuromuscular diseases that fall under the, the Muscular Dystrophy Association kind of umbrella um, don't have any swallowing difficulties. CMT comes to mind. Uh, so it's it kind of hit or miss, but um, and everybody in DM, of course, is an individual. So uh, even if we have two individuals that have the same number of repeats, um, we aren't seeing just yet that those necessarily correlate to, um, that the number of repeats correlates to ability levels. Um, so we have been, I've been part of a natural history study in the congenital form, as I mentioned earlier, for the last seven years. And of all the, the assessments that we've been doing with our children, um, we're, we're really not finding that that repeat number tends to correlate. So I tend to step back and just treat the person as an individual and wherever that they're at, meet them there. So, um, and then some selected references. There is a body of literature out there. It's not as big as I would like, but we're getting there. Um, there are quite a few people around the world that are studying myotonic dystrophy now. And uh, certainly at our site at VCU, we're partnering with um, quite a few sites uh, in across the US, across Canada, in uh, England and Europe. So um, stay tuned. Um, and then happy to take any questions. Um, and there's my email address if there's anything that has popped up. So let's see if I can see any questions. Ah, so I see one in there. Let me pop it out here. Oh, there's a good number of questions. Great. Um, so the first question I'm seeing is one about heartburn um, and uh, a procedure called the Nissen fundipl fundiplication. Um, that I'm not a physician, uh, I'm a speech language pathologist, so whether or not that's a good procedure for somebody with myotonic dystrophy is really a discussion to have with your neurologist and, and then a gastroenterologist. Um, can be engaged in that. Uh, it's not uncommon for in the congenital form for children to, if they're getting a feeding tube placed, um, to have a Nissen done at the same time, but that's certainly kind of a game time decision depending on sort of symptomology and all of that. Um, uh, I, I hear heartburn quite frequently in myotonic dystrophy, and we know there's a lot of GI symptoms um, with the adult form and with the, the children form as well too. Um, and then uh, additional question on hiccups. Um, that is usually the diaphragm just contracting pretty violently. Um, and uh, it is a challenging area. I don't know that anybody knows for sure that there's a perfect tip or trick um, to kind of quell that. Um, that might be a question to discuss with your um, with your neurologist or certainly with a gastroenterologist if you're working with one of them as well. Um, and then uh, another question came in as well about strengthening swallow. Uh, so uh, there are some, some exercises that we use in the rehabilitation side of things that uh, we do see some anecdotal uh, um, support for in myotonic dystrophy. There's not a lot of publications out there showing that there's, yes, do this one exercise and that's going to fix you. Again, I really kind of take individuals where they're at. So I would say meet with a speech language pathologist uh, and 
uh, see if there's maybe specific exercises, the different um, assessment tools that I talked about, the different ways of assessing swallow, really look at what the tongue is doing, what the throat is doing, even what the esophagus is doing to some extent, um, and then we can really target the, the specific area of concern. Well, let me scroll through a few more questions here. So I have a question on throat spasming. Um, pulmonary looked at this individual. Um, the barium swallow test was negative. Um, I'm not quite sure. So throat spasming can be a couple different things. I might, the question then became, do, you know, do I go to ENT? Do I go to neuro? Do, do I go to GI? Where do I kind of go? Um, and I would say, uh, certainly discuss with your neurologist. Hopefully, if you're uh, able to be seen in a multidisciplinary clinic, there's also a speech language pathologist there that can talk with you a little bit um, to sort of maybe specific, see what specific symptomology is going on. ENT may be a great place to go um, to see if they have any tips or tricks. Often, especially if you're in a larger academic center, ENT may also have SLPs there that can uh, that kind of work in concert with individuals and really look and see, is it laryngospasm? Is it um, triggered by specific foods or specific activities? Uh, so really a little bit more diagnostic. Sometimes going down this path means we get some negatives early on because we're ruling things out, but uh, it sounds like you're interested in continuing on to figure out what's at the root of this. So uh, certainly maybe discussing with your neurologist or going to ENT. Um, I have one where it's loud and I'm struggling. Could it be icopharyngeal? I'm not familiar with that term actually. Um, Maybe this is a continuation of the throat spasming piece. Um, it is a little bit challenging with that throat spasming to determine is it the myotonia itself? Um, and you know, is mixilatine something that might work? That's a question that was part of this as well too. So that may be a, a good discussion point with the neurologist to see um, you know, is it, this, uh, is it actually myotonia or is it something that we need to go to ENT for and kind of check out? Um, so shifting gears just a little bit, somebody posted asking that they get hoarse at the end of the day. Can this uh, be caused by DM2? Uh, that what I what I see with hoarseness is often that's a symptom of sort of fatigue of all these muscles of speech and swallow. Uh, and I see very commonly that hoarseness may be a thing at the end of the day. So. Uh, I like to encourage patients if you're seeing that kind of waning or, or increase of hoarseness towards the end of the day, that to really, if there's an event you need to do in the evening that you want to have a strong voice for, making sure you have some rest uh, along the way and you know maybe taking a nap in the middle of the afternoon to make sure that uh, those muscles just get a little bit of downtime if you need to have them ready and raring to go. Um, and then uh, again, the feeling of constantly needing to swallow or like there's something stuck in your throat. Um, there's some early hints that this may be uh, due to a sensory uh, issue in myotonic dystrophy. Uh, it's an area of interest, of specific interest of mine, research interest of mine. So I would say stay tuned on that. Um, but if this is something that is happening kind of between meals or you're always feeling like there's something stuck in your throat, certainly meeting with a speech language pathologist, perhaps with an ENT to maybe kind of scope and look and see how that, that is looking. Um, so there's a question on um, another one on hiccups. Hopefully I kind of addressed that enough. If not, please drop another one in the, the uh, questions window. Um, another question here on exercises that help with speech, particularly the volume of the voice and being understood. Um, I have treated patients in the past borrowing from the Parkinson's literature. So there's some great literature there showing that increasing volume um, and really focusing on that and sort of recalibrating how much effort we need to use to when we're speaking to get to a certain volume. So um, I worked with individuals with DM where we've had uh, like a sound meter there in the room and really calibrating on we know 
that normal conversation is at you know 65 70 decibels and uh, really measuring that with that sound meter with the person with DM uh, to make sure that we can recalibrate how much how much effort how much oomph we kind of got to put into to get a little bit louder so um, there's another question on is coughing in the morning common it is not uncommon I would say I do have uh, quite a few patients that would tell me that they they wake up first thing in the morning and maybe they have some mucus, maybe they have some coughing going on. Sometimes it can be from post nasal drip. Uh, I'm here in Virginia, allergy season seems to be quite protracted here and I have a lot of patients where that post nasal drip is very irritating. Uh, so maybe that's part of it. Uh, you can certainly meet with an SLP or an ENT, ear, nose and throat doc to hopefully get to the bottom of that a little bit. Um, it can sometimes be related to level of hydration as well too. Uh, if you live in a drier part of the country or I know there's a heat wave going out west right now, uh, you know, making sure you're pretty hydrated is, a, is an important piece so that you don't have a lot of kind of dry mucosal lining, especially first thing in the morning. Uh, let's see. Uh, if I have trouble with some foods, potatoes, why don't I have trouble problems with other foods and would seeing a speech therapist help? Um, it, that question may have come in before I got to the dysphagia part of the conversation today, um, but definitely potatoes in particular, especially French fries or baked potatoes tend to be drier. So I will tell people, you know, uh, put ketchup on them or if it's a baked potato, put, you know, sour cream, butter, all the good things, <laughs> gravy, that kind of stuff on them to make them a little bit moister, easier to eat. Um, it, the, you may be having difficulty with those um, because they are just like chicken sometimes tends to be one that people, if it's overcooked, it can be very dry. But if you have it in another um, form, it may be a little bit easier to eat. So um, let's see. So tips and tricks to prevent choking or aspiration when eating or drinking. I covered some of those in this as well. If there's additional ones, um, please drop them in the questions uh, box or, or send them along to the MDF and happy to field those if I didn't get those addressed as you were hoping during the talk. Um, when might you have to go to a feeding tube? Um, that is, I, I like to tell patients, that's a very personal choice. Um, you know, if it's a um, baby that's just born with CDM and they're really having serious eating issues, that's a time to really talk with the physician and, and you know, entertain that idea. Um, if it's an adult with, that's having increasing difficulties with swallowing, that's really a conversation for you to have with your physician, with your speech language pathologist, with the dietitian as well, if you're able to be seen in a multidisciplinary clinic and have access to that. Um, and, you know, I like to tell people when they get a feeding tube, it doesn't mean that you can't still eat by mouth, um, but that maybe we can use that feeding tube to really support nutrition, the bulk of nutrition, and then have more of the fun things by mouth. Uh, so, but really a conversation to have with an SLP uh, and hopefully dietitian, neurologist, uh, or PCP um, to, to see if that's a direction you need to go in. So. Uh, let's see, I, have some, I always feel like I have something in my throat. Why is this DM related? It can be, um, you know, it sort of depends on where in the throat it is, kind of what's contributing to that. So it would really be uh, probably useful to have a swallow study uh, to see kind of where food is hanging out and maybe um, what I like to do in radiology is also sort of test some strategies and see what kind of alleviates that symptomology as well too. So. Let's see, how do I avoid the thick tongue feeling? Um, that's one I hear a little bit more commonly uh, for individuals, especially first thing in the morning when maybe uh, that mucosal lining or the mouth is a little bit drier. So um, hydration can help with that. Um, I, I guess I would require a little bit more information. and I would love to chat maybe additionally as well. So happy to answer questions on that offline. But for some individuals, it may be that that tongue maybe isn't moving as well. In some of the studies we've done, in, in certainly the studies we've done in children, and we see it as well in adults, that tongue doesn't have the same strength as kind of an average uh, person might. Uh, so that may be contributing to some of that thick tongue feeling. So next question is, are there corrective surgeries that can maybe improve quality of life for those with dysphagia? Uh, I would say in myotonic dystrophy, it, 
not very commonly um, their surgeries. It sort of depends if there's another feature kind of going on that's also contributing to dysphagia. Maybe, um, you know, uh, so there's maybe some other interventions that we maybe do that maybe not be specifically myotonic dystrophy related, but maybe sort of what we call a kind of a comorbid diagnosis. Um, but uh, yeah, there's not a specific corrective surgery out there that's kind of the gold gold standard or the go-to to, to help. Um, we look at it more from a strategies and a, a management side of things. Um, uh, and then are there exercises that can be done to prevent atrophy, atrophy of the vocal cords and the muscles of the larynx? Um, there is not a body of literature on that right now. Um, there is uh, certainly, I know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of borrow from the Parkinson's world on that to say, um, you know, what might be appropriate, but cautious when we apply those kind of techniques in the myotonic dystrophy world, just because it's not something that has been well studied. It's an area of, because I get this question quite frequently when I see patients in clinic, it's definitely an area of research um, on my, my end that I'm very interested in. So please stay tuned. Um, as Tanya mentioned, there's unfortunately not very many people around the world looking at, at DM. And so um, there's a, a small group of us that we meet up at all the meetings meetings and, and we communicate offline in between meetings and uh, we're pretty passionate. We know this is an area that, that needs a lot of research, but uh, um, we just haven't, haven't gotten there and gotten all the ducks in a row just yet. So please stay tuned. And if there's any other questions, happy to take those. Otherwise, I can turn it back over to you, Tanya. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Kira. Um, that was really <laughs> wonderful, and incredibly educational. Um, it seems like there's a really positive response. People are very grateful that these very specific questions have been answered. Um, nothing new has come in to, okay. um, to the question box and, and nothing has come to me directly either. So I think we may have, have answered all the questions that are out there. But if we do receive anything after the fact, um, we will definitely forward them your information that you've provided here. Um, Perfect. And um, that would be great. Thank you for being with us today and for so comprehensively providing an overview of what's happening for speech and language and swallowing with DM. Um, we will have the video out hopefully within the next couple of days. Um, if people have questions, feel free to contact MDF. Otherwise, we're gonna wish you all a fantastic weekend and thank you again, Kira, for being with us and have a wonderful weekend. All right, thank you so much. This was great. Okay, take care. <laughs>